but uh but yeah how's it going ryan uh uh so anyway if anybody's yeah. uh, no nobody's watching right now but if anybody uh watches this in, in the near future ryan is doing uh software for us working with mark and uh and with john and um and the whole purpose of these of these little kind of podcasts is just to kind of give people an idea of what you know what we're all about um what kinds of things we think about what what kind of dumb things we say you know um and uh a little bit of behind the scenes you know uh that kind of thing so i thought maybe today we just start with uh ryan you could tell you know i'll ask you a little bit about your background and the kind of things you did before salia like why you started even in engineering and that, and that kind of thing um sure yeah i mean we could go go way how back far, how far they go back <laughs> Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, you know, since since I was a kid, you know, kind of being into computers, being into definitely video games. And I think that's kind of probably a lot of people's stories, you know, about kind of being drawn to that sort of thing, uh, kind of getting into programming or at least into computers because of that. Um, and that was certainly the case for me. Uh, what kind of games really influential, influential for you? Growing up. Sorry, what was that? What kind of games were super influ- like the most influential growing up? Let's see. I mean, so I had an I had an NES, and then I had a Genesis, which was kind of a weird switch, and then I had an N sixty four. So I mean, you know, console up to a certain point, and then middle school kind of got into computer gaming, and that's yeah, it done a little bit before that, but you know, that's kind of when I had access to a machine that I could use whenever I wanted Mm -hmm. and RTSs were kind of a big thing. Uh, I really liked Starcraft. That was probably the first game that I was Mm -hmm. super into. And then single player uh, online. I I pretty much exclusively play games online. Um, I mean, not, not necessarily the case for the, for consoles, but it's like once I got into multiplayer gaming, I think that was, pretty much all I did. And even now it's like, I mean, I don't play, I don't play too many games these days, but when I do, it's almost exclusively multiplayer. Um, But yeah, Starcraft two or Starcraft. um, And then I played EverQuest for a while. I don't Uh know if you know what that is. Uh, I'm only vaguely familiar actually. Yeah, uh, nicknamed Evercrack, so that'll kind of tell you a uh-huh. little about it. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, so it's, I mean, it's an MMORPG, uh-huh. kind of one of, one of the early ones, um, at least in terms of like being a full 3D MMO. Um, obviously, World of Warcraft kind of at a certain point surpassed it, but uh, uh-huh. yeah, I played that for a while, played Counter Strike. That was kind of after EverQuest. And, and and again, like all these are pretty much exclusively online. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I mean, so gaming wise, that's kind of what I did. And then programming wise, had a few kind of false starts. Uh, did some web programming for a while. Like when I was in middle school, I bought this. Uh, what was it? It was like HTML4. Mm-hmm. Which is so weird. Like this is, you know, late 90s. And what we're HTML5 now. So it's like HTML4 I know, right? in 24 hours. Uh-huh. Um, One of those and, uh, Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And like bought this book at a Staples and just kind of sat down and poured through it and then made some websites. I had a StarCraft website. Um, what was sort of web- the idea there? Is it to kind of have something cool to show your friends sort, sort of thing or post school? start just want, anecdotes or something or just well, to... i just wanted to build stuff uh-huh. honestly it, that that was it like i and so so one other thing that we i built with a friend of mine was this uh this website for our kind of for our school i guess like it wasn't necessarily for the school it's more like hey it's a website that's like about stuff at our school um yeah and we'd have polls and that sort of thing and then you know yeah we'd like early days we have posts sure. that we'd put up there um and i all, all hosted on geo cities by the way so that was <laughs> nice. a thing at the time uh-huh. um and just loved just kind of wanted to build stuff honestly and it wasn't even 
like I didn't even necessarily have stuff I wanted to build. Like I was even just interested. Like if somebody had something they wanted me to build, I, like I, in, in fact, like I'd kind of seek that out. I was like, I like somebody tell me what they want me to build because mm-hmm. I just want to build stuff. And I don't necessarily have any great ideas myself, but I want to go and build something. So, cause I just enjoy that part of it. Um, yeah. And then eventually. So what was the GeoCities? It would you just like log in to GeoCities and like edit the HTML or did, was, was it, did that some of the WYSIWYG thing or? Yeah, it was, but it was uh, the former. So you would just log in and you'd basically have like a, the ability to create files. And so you just create your HTML yeah. files, your CSS files, uh, your JavaScript files, what have you. And, and that's kind of it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I remember. I mean, I wasn't, but, the, well, but over at FTP, it was like the sort of default. Uh, um, I gosh, was I don't, I don't remember. I think they must have had a way to FTP your files over. Although I think I exclusively just did it online. Just did it online, and I mean, even at the time, it was kind of magical. Like, I didn't totally understand every aspect of it. Like I knew I could, okay, I could punch in my HTML here, and I knew how all that worked, and the like any JavaScript type stuff was like, I'm probably taking it from another website and then trying to integrate that into my website right, right. or like, you know, pulling it from some examples online somewhere and then trying to fit it to mine. Um, right. And that was kind of it. Uh, the It's so funny. Like, so I had this splash screen and it would be like, it was basically just like supposed to be this really intense, like, are you ready for, you know, my StarCraft website basically. Yeah, uh, splash screen, which kind of fell out of favor. Like that used to kind of be a I thing know. where you'd like go to a website and have a splash. Like why? I don't know why. Like it's yeah, <laughs> it especially like cool. flash or something. It was like flat. Yeah, flash was big too. I, I did some flash stuff too. That was kind of fun, okay. uh, but mostly consumed it on like Newgrounds. I don't know if you remember that. Uh, uh-uh. what's that? Yeah, Newgrounds. Newgrounds. Um, it was just a website that people would publish. I don't know if it was all flash, but like, like it was either all flash or 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 majority flash uh-huh. a uh, shockwave or something games or animations lots mm-hmm. of that sort of thing um and it was yeah it was just really cool and so i kind of wanted to do stuff like that too um but yeah mo- mostly just i don't know yeah just kind of played with it i didn't do anything serious but it was that was that was fun as well um Photoshop doing that sort of thing was also fun. Uh huh. Just like any of that stuff, like just creating stuff was, I think, just really enjoyable and interesting. Oh, this, this Photoshop was just a legit copy of Photoshop. Um. Well, I had a version at school, so that was probably legit. Oh yeah, there I go. I have no comment on any version I made. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know what? Actually, I I had a version of I think Paint Shop Pro. Also, like for, uh, for making Flash, what was that the um, the Macromedia Flash editor or whatever back in the days? Uh, yeah, yeah. Anyway, so you said Paint Paint Shop Pro what was it? What was that? Yeah, Paint Shop Pro was another one. It was it was cheaper. Yeah, I, I, I had a version of either that or Photoshop that I had purchased from eBay or right, right, right. You know, similar auction website of the time, and. I, like I think I was trying to be legit about it. Right, know, right. Not I think that stuff was legit because like, was like you'd actually people would just put their old CDs on there, right? Um, like, yeah, so they probably like version seven. They'll just put their version six on. You know, like uh, I, m- I remember doing that at some point. But. Yeah, that makes sense. I think for in, in this particular case, I just got a CDR with a printed label on it and was right. like, okay, <laughs> well, I guess I you know I did my part. Like I tried to do this legit. I, I'm not going to feel bad about this. <laughs> and I'm also like in middle school and I have no money. And yeah, exactly. You know, this is like, yeah, better than I think what most people were doing. So I felt okay about it. But uh, yep. That, so that, that was kind of the story there. And then also, you know, again, still into games and like did l- like land party type stuff with friends. And that was fun. Um, of course, all that's kind of, for the most part online now. I mean, at the time it was like, I had dial up at home, so we weren't going to do that. Eventually we got right. cable, but mm-hmm. you know, actually in high school. How much bandwidth do those games 
I mean, like, I don't, I don't really know much about like online, early online games. So, you know, like Doom had like the, you know, that null modem cable you could do, but like, yeah. could you use dial up? I mean, it's not that much data, right? And in dial up, definitely could. Yeah. I mean, it depends on the game, but yeah. De- I mean, cert- I guess it probably depends when it was made because that'll kind of tell you what it was built for. But yeah. Um, certainly a lot of those, a lot of those early games. I mean, in, in StarCraft for sure, I played that on dial. I played EverQuest mm-hmm. on dial up. Um, and also would play StarCraft with a friend of mine where I just dial directly to him. Right, right, exactly. Um, yeah. yeah. He he had the luxury of having an extra line where I as I did not. So <laughs> right, right. I remember that was the thing. Or you could also do the shotgun modems, right? Like uh yeah. that would be the ultimate is to have two dedicated phone lines. Yeah, um, well, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Well, so what was the, the whole like college thing? Like was that like a what kind of thought process went into that? Was it just like, oh, it seems like what I want to do. Uh, School-wise? Yeah, I mean, I, yeah. before... So... Yeah, like, I wasn't totally sure what I was going to do. And had kind of always been into computers and kind of felt like I wanted to do something in tech, but also kind of had tried getting into programming a little bit, but it didn't really stick. And I didn't really... I don't know if there just like aren't weren't as many resources at the time as there are now, or maybe maybe nowadays if I were to go through it again, it'd be a little bit different. Um, or maybe you know if I had like a mentor or something that would have helped. But definitely like pre college, it was. Um, I tried to do it and would kind of start, and it was just kind of overwhelming. It's like from my perspective, it was like oh, I want to go and build you know a right. game right but you, and you like didn't have anybody to kind of examples, go to there was like a mentor at all like any friend that knew more than you about it or anything not really yeah not really yeah. anybody i mean maybe there was somebody out there but nobody i knew and <clears throat> the ambition was kind of like okay i want to build these games i'm playing and these games i'm playing are made by yeah big you know maybe not necessarily huge teams at the time but at least like you know for me who knows nothing i'm not going to go and build some 3d game so yeah. Speaking of which, did you ever use like 3D Studio Max or anything or try to make uh, like 3D assets of any kind? Uh, I did curious. a little bit. There was a, yeah, there was a, an application called Milkshape 3D. Uh-huh. And so I'd, I'd make things in that. Mostly well, like, like yeah. weapons for, you know. Oh, like mods or like Counter-Strike or something? For like Quake, that sort of thing. Okay. Um, so that was a lot of fun. Yeah. I had a short detour into Sims. I really liked Sims for a while. And you could down... Like Sims I don't remember if I... Or what do you no, mean? No, like The Sims. Right, The Sims. Like, like no, sorry, not Sim City. What's it called? Yeah, Sim. The Sims, right? Yeah, yeah. The Sims, yeah. The little people and that thing. Yeah, like you build houses. Yeah, you build houses. You kind of like navigate. Uh, Isn't online like multi- massively multiplayer? It was, right? Uh, They eventually had an online version. I mean, the original version's were not i bet that okay, right, right. but later on they definitely had something i mean i i was not playing it at that time so i don't i'm not sure what those were like but um played the original and like i don't think i ever actually modded it but would download tons of stuff and that was just was pretty cool that was just third party content yeah yeah, yeah. Just oh, I, remember, I, re- yeah I, remember, I don't know what i used to do that for that's a good i remember doing that yeah um, lots of it was like acquiring stuff too like it's not even necessarily about pl- like I would play with it, but at the same time, I was like, oh, I just want to like get all this stuff and just like have access to it. And for some reason, that was just really right. Like, right. Having this library like a collection stuff. type thing, rather yeah. than yeah, um, collecting stamps. Yeah, yeah, exactly. They're collecting well, acorns. It's like the evolutionary drive to collect acorns. <laughs> right. Something, something that you know what I mean. Yeah, um, saving up for the future. Yeah. Well, so anyway, I wasn't totally sure what I wanted to do. And then eventually um, did computer engineering, which... Is this around like 2005 or something like that? Yeah, like 2005. Context. Yeah, 2005. Um, and really enjoyed it. Like, it was just... It was like finally where like I get to spend all my time doing something that I really enjoy. It did take me a little while. Like, I didn't really... There, you know, were like introductory classes that were not super enjoyable. I mean, they were okay, they were fine, but 
I didn't love them. And then it was really when you start getting into lower level stuff, at least for me, where it was like, oh, this, like, I actually understand what's going on here. Mm -hmm. You know, it's opening everything up and it's not just this black box. I mean, ultimately there's kind of like always another layer, but. Right, right. You know, it's, how you actually understand. Go? What's that? How low kind of in the layers did you end up going? Like, 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 for example, in electrical engineering, there's like the classes on kind of build your own CPU kind of thing in simulation or otherwise, um, you know, yeah. build you and an instruction set, um, you know, decoding, that kind of stuff. Yeah, we, we had to do that. Cool. Yeah, I mean, you do like the first class where it was like, oh, this is like, I'm actually getting to dig into some stuff was doing assembly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, that's Actually, kind of where it's like, oh, I'm kind of at the lowest level I could kind of reasonably go, uh -huh. uh, at least for programming. And then, you know, eventually doing a little bit of uh, Verilog and VHDL and then doing kind Brilliant. of what you're talking about of actually writing those and that's cool. simulating, that, not necessarily um, running it on an FPGA, but at least like simulating it. And doing all that that's cool we, we had this I, I forget what it was called some kind of um i think it was called logic works which is very similar to what we're called <laughs> the logic but um right but anyway it, it was it was basically kind of like a use well if i'm understanding correctly it was kind of like a useless toy in comparison to verilog right as in like it's it's fine for education but um wasn't actually deployable <laughs> hardware i don't know if that's true anymore or not so i don't know about logic works i don't remember I don't know if I, I'm looking it up right now. I don't know I if think I think that's what it was called. For some it's reason, it fun. reminds me of, there, there was this other, there, it there is. was this Java thing called Alice. And it was like this 3D environment where you would program in Java and it would, you know, move the same things on screen. And like, basically you'd be programming in Java, but in this 3D environment. So it was almost like, I guess, like pro programming within a game engine. Right, um, right. And I... Yeah, I, I remember really not liking that because that was like even more just, oh, just magic. Like I'm, I'm typing this right. stuff and some cool stuff happens, but I have no idea. Like I know I didn't do you know 99% of what just happened. Right. right. You couldn't ship it to somebody. I, I mean, maybe. I don't know. Oh, uh, Maybe. Yeah, I don't know. if the, I mean, it was definitely targeted at learning from what I remember. Right. Yeah, um, it is interesting. Like a lot of that sort of like learning experiences, like your first experience with coding is in such an artificial environment that it, 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 I could see it being very like, okay, great. But it's like very abstract. You know, you know how like they, yeah. they have the ones where you like get to write some code to kind of like move a little thing out of the way or whatever. I mean, like some kind of like video game eyes, like, um, you know, move your character five spaces this way. And then to exactly. The left, and, um, I mean, it's sort of like coding in the sense of like making, your character move around and fair enough, but it's not like coding in the sense of building something useful. Um, yeah. And you definitely lose a lot of the art. You're not really architecting in anything in those cases. Like you're almost just yeah. listing out commands um, and you kind of learn a little bit of the structure, but I think it's helpful to kind of have to do everything from end to end. Um, yeah. Like have a project. Yeah, exactly. Where you're just kind of starting from scratch and Sure, maybe you have access to a few libraries, but you're definitely like not using some sort of framework that's doing 90% of everything for you. Um, or like kind of deciding the architecture for you. I think it's useful to go through that process and right and fail because you learn from that. So yeah. Is it analogies that would be relevant to our customer base with like you know Arduino and things like that, right? Or NetDuino or or like the various like Python running microcontroller platforms that are out now. Yeah, Arduino is a lot like that, right? Because you just, it's basically like, hey, here's your, you know, setup function, here's your loop function, and yeah, you just kind it of turns out it's like way closer to the wire than, than. So I, I started like on the basic stamp. I don't know if you've ever heard of that. This company called yeah. Relax, like it was like pre Spark Fun and pre Arduino. Um, anyway, it was basically like these. They made up their own language, basically, and um, yeah. And it was definitely not something and, and like the basic stamp I remember was like fifty dollars. This was in two thousand or something, right? And it was definitely not what you wanted to design into a product, right? And yeah. uh, and uh, but you can see on the little board there was a microcontroller and like something magical about the microcontroller um, that was worth learning. You know? um, and uh, it turns out that you know you can do all the same things by running C or assembly language. Actually, yeah. I, I only did assembly language early on. I didn't even know C was really. I don't think that there was any like free C compilers or maybe i just didn't know where they were 
Mm -hmm. So I started out doing like, just like assembly language for the PIC micro, for microchip, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah. Like only, it was like 20 instructions. It was really, really easy stuff. You know, like um, in my first product actually, yeah, it was just like all that. Um, it was just assembly language. Yeah. Do a, yeah. It's, I don't know. It's kind of nostalgic for those days, actually. Like <laughs> the instruction set is so ridiculously simple that you can pretty much memorize the whole thing. Yeah, for sure. And, uh, but and keep anyway. everything in your head at once, which is yeah. not true for all, for most things these days. Um, yeah. Cool. <clears throat> so, so you graduated and uh, um, what was your first job or first uh, internship or whatever? Um, I mean, I did a couple things before that. I like while I was in school, mm -hmm. um, why, like while I was in school, I worked for Caltrans for a while. They had the, this department of research and innovation. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so I, I was working from there doing, it was basically like when, you know, after, after my classes, I'd go there and work. And so I was working there part-time. That was, that was pretty cool. Worked on, um, a number, a couple different things, but kind of the big thing was we were working with these CCTV cameras that'll be on the, you know, they'll be um, stations on the side of highways and that sort of thing in rural areas. Oh, okay. Yeah. And so I, I was just right. I was one, I was writing software, some that ran on a PC that would allow you to um, control those devices. And then we also had this handheld device uh, that we, that we were using, um, and programming that to be able to do things like, again, control the CCTV cameras, but also be able to do things like download images from them and, and that sort of thing. So it was it was pretty interesting. Um, and it was a handheld a device, and you were writing code for this thing, like some kind of embedded thing that had buttons and a little screen on it or yeah, something. Yeah, ex exactly. So it, you know, it had a small like I don't know two and a half inch screen or something like that, black and white, and then uh, huh. a bunch of physical buttons on it. Gotcha. You, you know if that was something that you guys had built in house or some kind of like kind of like a Palm Pilot, somebody else built it and you guys can just write firmware for it. No, right. this was by. Let me look it up because I can. Yeah, feel free to share your screen. By the way, if you get it up. Sure. Um. I don't know if I'll be able to find it. I can't That's find okay. it right now. But it it was like wirelessly connected somehow or it had a cord or? It had a cord. So this was all over primarily RS-232. So it was all serial. Um, nice. But we also, we also had these, um, these little RS-232 to TCP IP like server units, right? Interesting. So, so, so you have it would be like a socket endpoint. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, exactly. So you just connect to it write and read to it and That's all cool. that would just get you know sent and read read over serial so you could um you could control these remotely which was kind of part of the idea is that you could just oh you, you have it like on a public ip of some kind and, and it had that yeah exactly exactly that's awesome yeah i love that kind of stuff where you build a website that controls some hardware somewhere kind of thing yeah um, yeah so that was fun did that then um I did a Google summer of code one, one year or like one cool. summer. And this was a, wrote a um, X11 input driver for doing like multi-touch stuff. So there was this, ver there was this version of X11 at the time that supported multiple cursor cursors. It was, it wasn't actually in um, any like, <laughs> released sure. version of it you know it's just kind of like a was it a side so version that eventually was, at the same time or you and your friend could be both doing things at the same time or was it actually like an actual mobile application kind of a intent or like multi-touch i mean <clears throat> yeah the so the idea was yeah you could use like separate a separate mouse and keyboard within a desktop environment so you could, right right in theory have multiple people using it 
Um, the other idea was that you'd be able, specifically for the case I was writing it for, was to be able to use it with uh, a multi-touch screen. Right, right. Oh, exactly. Oh, exactly. Yeah. So that that was that was the intent. Um, so you basically you bridge between some kind of like touch sensor and like manipulating the cursors. Yeah. So this was like, actually so there there was it wasn't talking with any specific hardware. There was a separate process or like separate server effectively that would run that was controlling all this um, that would actually produce that would actually send out all of the touch events. And the driver itself was connecting to that. Everything was getting streamed over UDP and then converting those into actual touch events on screen or actually cursor. Mouse events. manipulation kind of stuff, like, like mouse down, mouse up, click or something like that. Yeah, um, exactly. And then the doing a bunch of dynamic stuff to like create cursors on the fly. Oh, so, so how many different cursors could there be? I don't remember what the limit was, but you know, probably. That's cool. So you could do like the whole like, multi, you know, multi-touch, like playing the keyboard kind of thing. Um, that's the idea, yeah. Yeah, that was kind of the magic of like the iPad and such back in the day. It seemed like it's just like you could have multiple things going on, you know? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Ultimately, <clears throat> so I actually don't know where that went more recently. Um, but ultimately, it relied quite a bit on actual desktop support and application support for this to work correctly. So, right. you know, it... It actually being a useful thing depends quite a bit on application developers to actually put this into their software. So exactly, but it, I mean, it was it was it was a lot of fun for I, I enjoyed it quite a bit, and um, it was yeah, it was a good learning experience. What, was there a kind of an application in mind? It wasn't related to Android. It was something else, or <clears throat> yeah. So here I'll let me look this sure. real quick. You just move some stuff around. So full screen this. Oops. Can you see this? Uh, no. Are you sharing your screen? There we no. go. Just no starting. Yeah, so this is the this is the protocol, this TUIO. There's uh -huh. TUIO, but I don't know if that's actually <clears throat> correct. Um, oh, this is one of the Microsoft uh, like, like what's called Surface kind of things. Is that right? Very si very similar. Yeah. So this is so the guy who created this, uh, Martin Kel Keltenbrunner, he also um, had created cool. these things, which is like this big table. That has these um, projectors. Kind of has all these these little uh, blocks on it, mm -hmm. and and you can use those to um, basically create music. So it's this interactive kind of multi-touch um, panel that you can create music on, and you know you can like turn a block to do certain things, and and you know yeah. set things up sort of like this big synthesizer. So. Kind of neat, um, but this is this was like part of the kind of like related to this was the type of stuff that people would would use this for. Um, this was the guy that was kind of like 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 the mentor or I forget what it was called, um, but the person that I was working with. Oh, um, he's a Google employee. He maybe now I don't know. Oh, okay. Oh, you mean like what, what's from, the Google uh, from Google Summer Code? The... Yeah, how does that work? So Google Summer Code is a, a thing where they basically Google sponsors open source projects. So okay. so you you will work with an open source project, um, you know, to work on different things that they're looking to build. So in this particular case, it was building a multi-touch driver for um, for Linux. So gotcha. that, that's what I was working on. And, and this is specifically 
kind of what the implementation was. Um, nice. Is that like actually at Google headquarters or at some Google facility or is it remote or? or? Uh, it's all remote. Yeah, I don't know. Oh, if they, okay. they, they may do something in-house, but yeah, it's it's remote. No, I kind of assumed, I mean, perhaps wrong, that Google Summer of Code was kind of to try to identify talent. Is that roughly correct or is it is it just kind of like, um, I, mean, I, I don't know, what, what, what sort of the, um, or is it kind of like a, I don't even know what it would be exactly. Um, kind of like a mentorship program or, or some kind of community give back kind of a thing or something. I think, th yeah, I mean, that's kind of how I've always taken it. Mentorship plus also community give back. I don't know if there's any intent there to, you know, use it as a way to recruit Recruiting. people or Interesting. to okay. find talent. But did, did, you, did you people apply? To, do, you get to, do you get paid or is it is it strictly like? Uh... Yeah, so you get paid. Okay. So there's some um, kind of application process. They don't just take any. There, yeah. So there's an application process. Um, basically, you apply with a uh, proposal of what you're going to do and kind of how you're going to do it. Cool. And you know, eventually, you know, get selected or not selected, and <clears throat> and then, as the name implies, you kind of work on this project during the summer, uh -huh. and then predicated upon actually finishing. I think it. If I remember correctly, there were a couple milestones, you know, like once halfway through and once at the end. And then, mm -hmm. you know, if, if you are on track at that milestone, then, you know, you'll get paid basically. Oh, really? That's interesting. Yeah. So it's pay for performance and you might not get paid anything. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. So as far as I remember, like if you, if you just applied and then did not, it got accepted and then did nothing, you would not get paid. Well, it's not just that you wouldn't do anything, but but you, if somehow you got something useful to work that some you got something to show for if it wasn't just yeah <laughs> trying hard and failing or something. Yeah, I don't know what the criteria there is in terms of like whether you like if you worked the entire time, but ultimately there were you know didn't produce what you expected to produce or. Right. I mean, it's it seems it's like it could easily be the case for I mean, depending on what the project was you took on, it could easily be, you know. Depends on what you took on it, but if that was realistic or not, you know. Yeah, I think I think if it's more like especially something that's more research based or something that's just going to be super risky. Um, yeah, you have no idea if it's actually going to be successful. Um, for anything like that, I think it's pretty reasonable to expect that hey, somebody may not actually deliver the thing that you expect to deliver, but gotcha. that's okay. Um, ultimately, you know, ideally, there's some sort of artifact that's like. Hey, here's all the things that didn't work, right? Really, right? Or here's gotcha. kind of what we figured out, even though we didn't necessarily deliver what we were hoping to deliver. Did you already kind of have contact with this particular open source project and and already talked to them about working on it or something? Or um... uh, I talked to them a little bit beforehand, like before proposing, but it wasn't like this was something that I was super involved in beforehand. Okay. So you, like, you kind of had this idea that you wanted to do this, but you didn't really, it wasn't like somebody sponsored you from that project or anything. It said like, you just like you on your own initiative, you said, Hey, I want to contribute to this open source project uh, in this, in this particular way. Yeah, it was. Yeah, exactly. It was, I had found out about it and thought this is, this is really interesting. I'd like to learn more about this. And also it just, yeah, the whole thing sounds really interesting. Um, and I started digging in more and what, like typically uh, any, any project that at, is actually involved with Google Summer of Code will have a bunch of different projects that they, you know, they sort of give as examples of things that you could work on sort of mm -hmm. suggestions. You know, I, I think in general, you can kind of suggest whatever you want. You could propose any sort of project, but um, you know, oftentimes there's like a list of like, Hey, here's a bunch of things that we'd love to have somebody work on. Um, right. So, you know, that's, that's how I specifically found out about this part of the, you know, like this particular feature that they wanted to have done. Um, and I thought it sounded really interesting and then just spent a bunch of time kind of researching it and getting a better idea of what, you know, what would be required to actually do it, you know? Awesome. This was all, you know, basically lived on, you know, it was like using a, again, a, like a specific branch of, um, of X11, that actually supported multiple pointers um, and then um, you know understanding how the protocol worked for this 
you know, the multi-touch stuff and then well, it also how seems all like this would come together. It, it kind of implies a certain hardware setup or some, some kind of a situation where you could actually test this out, right? How did you end up doing that? Did you actually have multiple mice or some kind of simulation or? Um... Well, yeah, so there was actually a mobile application you could use as your multi-touch oh, device. Oh, touch okay, gotcha. And because this was all, this was all over UDP, it, you know, you could just use your phone, for instance, as the multi-touch input and connect that to your computer, and then use that as as your input device. For your Wait, what year was this approximately? Like, I mean, is this like iPhone? Like, uh, okay, so like it's like like three GS iPhone three GS or something like that. Something like that, yeah. Or, okay. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that was fun. That was that was a cool project. And then as I was finishing up school. I um, started working for a company kind of like based in the Bay Area. Um, and um, so this, this was this company called Cabulous, now called Flywheel. Um, they oh. were doing um, basically taxi hailing from your phone. Um, uh, using, and how did that, what was sort of the back end for that? Like, yes, all the people. What's that? Like, like calling, I mean, I was imagining like you could call the call center automatically or something and, um, but trying to hack <laughs> well, this up. I mean, like, yeah. So, I mean, uh, yeah, there were multiple iterations of this, but <clears throat> so, what, uh, well, yeah. So when I joined, I was kind of wanting to do Android stuff. Like that was uh -huh. kind of the idea I had in my head. I was like, Hey, um, basically I was looking for a job to pay rent. Like that's, that's ultimately what it was. It was like, I'm, you know, finishing up school. I mm -hmm. need to pay my rent. I don't, you know, I did the Google summer of code thing. Um, I want something, in, you know, something to work on and um, applied for this ultimately got hired was kind of initially again, expecting to do Android stuff mm -hmm. uh, that I, and this was like, I'm trying to remember this, this is not too long after Android launched. I mean, maybe within exactly. a couple of years. Couple years. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. This was like, this cool. is this new thing. It's pretty cool. I really want to, you know, learn it. Like, it seems like one is just interesting, but also it just seems like a good, good thing to learn. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, at that time, the whole like idea of developing for mobile was like a red hot, like, like yeah. get on the bandwagon right now kind of thing. So yeah. Just, yeah. 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 Especially on the iOS side with the app store yeah. and everything. No, exactly. Uh, they had those big events where they're, they had all the VCs and um, like, yeah, yeah. Anyway, they're, they're really excited about it. So. Yeah. So that was, um, that's what I wanted to do. And ultimately like, well, actually we need somebody to do ser like server side stuff for us. Like uh, back -end right. stuff. That's really what we need. And we do it in this language called Erlang, which I had, like, I was like, okay, I don't know what that is. Um, yeah. I'm not <laughs> sure what it is. I mean, it's I'm, uh, I'm created sure. by this company called, you know, by Ericsson. And it's like, okay, a telecom company. Uh, <laughs> that's interesting. That. Um, so, um, ultimately joined and they were like hey you know here like the first thing i did was like building this admin interface on the on the back end and you know just you like know, a crud kind of thing like uh what's that like, like crud like apple like yeah but basically like, i mean like rest connected to database updates or something like that basically um, yeah yeah so the um erling had this built in database that they called uh, amnesia um which you know super well named right <laughs> great name uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it loses per hour yeah. yeah it was it was in memory you know you persist it to disk um, oh interesting yeah it's supposed to be like high perform like what, what was that one that was like super popular for a while um i forget it, it, the, the red redis is that right no oh, redis yeah like anyway um, um, you know, it actually wasn't that much different than that. Um, but anyway, so this, it was also like, it was distributed anyway, it was pretty, it was pretty cool. Um, but I like th this actual interface was like, okay, well build an HTTP, both the server side, you mm -hmm. know, building the, the HTTP server side stuff for this admin interface that works with this amnesia database. And, um, obviously doing the client side stuff as well. And at this point, like I really had not done web stuff since, you know, yeah. what I was talking yeah, that, about. That's what was kind of cool. I mean, 
like it's yeah. all kind of the same in terms of language. So even if it's not on the, you know, that, that's cool though. Yeah, yeah, it was it was pretty cool. It was uh, it was a fun experience to have. Like I had I hadn't really done uh, back end stuff. Didn't really know anything about it. Didn't really know anything about web stuff other than kind of what I had learned from my HTML four and twenty four hours book. Right, right. You know, ten, 10 years prior or whatever. Yeah. And uh, mm -hmm. I, 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 what's that? Oh, uh, no, that's good. Oh, I just remember basically like just sitting down in uh, Pete's coffee shop, just like reading as many tutorials as I possibly could about uh -huh. Ajax and, you know, yeah, yeah, everything yeah. else to do with, you know, any Erlang specific stuff and anything like that. Cause at the time I was just like, I don't even know, I don't know any of this stuff and now I've got to figure it out. Um, I'm imagining you're more or less in charge of the UX of this experience too, as opposed to, you know, getting something handed down from design or something. Yeah, we didn't have a designer. So exactly. that's, yeah. what, that's what I'm imagining, which is kind this of cool. Like, you, you're pretty good at that kind of stuff, right? Like the. Yeah, I mean, this was like. That. Yeah, I mean, and this was like a very, this was like the first thing I got. It wasn't really, you know, it's just like a really basic admin interface for internal use. Yeah, yeah, exactly. and you know, not user facing, and just trying to get a handle on how everything works in right. And uh, that's, that reminds me, you know, like you know, PHP admin and those like, yeah, uh, like they <laughs> that, that's sort of like the first line of defense on admin interface, right? <laughs> Going yeah. to edit the database directly, <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I just made me think of that, yeah, um, yep, yeah. It was anyway, it was a lot of fun. Um, so Basically, I took, I mean, there were, you know, the company was really small, right? It's like five or six people. It's this really small startup. Yeah. Um, I'm, uh, I basically end up owning the back end stuff. I'm working with um, one other, one other guy who's doing all the, the web stuff. Plus, like he ended up taking over a lot of the actual like front end web stuff. And then also. Um, all the mobile stuff for the most part. There was some Android stuff that we had um, a contractor working on, but really it was it was us two who was working on this. And so learned a bunch of backend stuff and that was yeah. that was pretty cool. Later worked for um, a mobile game company um, making mobile games. Um, on on back -end Android stuff. or iOS? Uh, iOS. So yeah, like what, but, what, what, what's an example of a, one of the games you worked on and what kind of, what what's sort of the tech stack and, um, and kind of complexity level, I guess, or, uh, um, yeah. So I mean, so this, uh, the, yeah, the, the company was the play forge. They originally built this game called zombie farm and then had a bunch of other, a lot of the other games that kind of spun out after that were, were based on that IP. Um, there were a couple other a couple of games that were not, but yeah, for the most part, it was like you know was all zombie farm stuff. So zombie farm two, zombie life, um, another number of other games. Gotcha. Uh -huh. The tech stack was when I joined, it was PHP. I forget if we had any Python stuff, but for all the new stuff, we ended up switching over to Python. So on the back end, on the back end, yeah, pr pretty right. much exclusively Python, and then front end Objective C. And okay. I didn't work that much on the front. I mean, I really didn't work on the front end. It was, it was, it was back end. Gotcha. And it was PHP and eventually Python, you said? Uh, yeah. So, I mean, pretty much immediately. Like I, I joined, um, they had just launched this game called Tree World. And uh, it was, the back end was written in PHP. Um, but everything after that was Python. Interesting. So there was really nothing that I, other than like maintaining the PHP code base. Right. It was, it was Python. And it, did this need to be like massively scalable? I'm imagining kind of it, at least quasi has to be right. For what we were doing. It was, yeah. I mean, it was very scalable at this point. It was like all this stuff was on AWS. Um, it was uh -huh. like, I don't know, 2013 or something. Was it kind of like a, a little group of users would be sort of uh, need, need to talk to each other at, at low latency, but not the entire world, so to speak? Um, yeah, we also never did. Like there were no multiplayer games where there were a bunch of people in a single area. A lot of, a lot of it was uh, multiplayer interactions, but not necessarily like, you know, live interactions on the screen, if that makes sense. Oh, okay. Like, 
like something you did two days before impacts them, but it's kind of yeah. like, a, like, a, like, oh, I make, you know, it's like, oh, I can go make trades with people. I can make friends. I can do all that largely like crud tile type stuff. Yeah, um, gotcha. Later on, we did kind of get into making a game that would be more live, but yeah, I mean, that, that never ended up happening. So gotcha. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so n- not too much to say there, but. Maybe we can spend maybe five more minutes. I know I got Neil coming up here in a second, but um, oh sure, uh, yeah. So like, and then was it was um, is it was an your next role the most recent one? Yeah, yeah. So after that, I got into VR stuff. Um, basically, just like loved this idea of virtual reality. Um, really wanted to get involved in it, and so I started working for this company called High Fidelity. Was this right uh, after the Oculus Rift kind of beta, whatever the heck they called that thing, developer preview one? Yeah, so I, I yeah, so I backed the Kickstarter. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Gotten the, yeah, yeah. Gotten the dev kit. And um, then, so this was like the DK1 and then there was the DK2. And so this was kind of like, I think right before the DK2 was shipped. So kind of that time frame. Uh-huh. Um, started working with High Fidelity and they were basically just building a kind of like the metaverse. I mean, a lot of people talk about the metaverses these days, and I think that was kind of the ultimate, you know, that was the ultimate goal was to build this large set of connected worlds, 3D, you know, 3D worlds that you can either access in a virtual reality headset or from a desktop. Mm -hmm. um, Was it a startup founded for that particular purpose? Or or was it um, a game company that kind of was pivoting into that or, or making a product for it? the the people so it had kind of spun out of something completely unrelated but um you know a lot of the funding that they got later on was was under was under that was under this idea of building these virtual worlds and like so like if i wanted to sort of buy this solution so to speak for whatever reason how would i go about buying it would i be buying like a complete set of hardware and software for my remote work team or something um or was it what was kind of the the idea of it um i mean the idea was software so it wasn't necessarily uh, building hardware it would you know okay. it wasn't building vr hardware so it was depending on consumer you know like oculus or um or vive hardware being available and people using those with the software and the idea behind the software was mm-hmm. um i mean like the actual revenue model was you know, up, up in the air in terms of like how, how it would actually be monetized. But um, to give a little background, people could host their own servers. Um, but then we, so we provided both server and client software for people to host their own servers, build out worlds, um, and then people could download the client and, and connect to those worlds. And this was, this was all free. Um, yeah. Now we did like later on, there were different approaches we took to try to monetize it so having a marketplace where people could buy and sell stuff was one um later on we tried for a bit to pivot into doing um kind of like remote work stuff so being able to use the software as a virtual office space Mm -hmm. um and then you could imagine feasibly like paying a monthly fee for something like that but Where, where the office space kind of thing would be more of a curated out of the box experience it wouldn't be like a do it yourself is that kind of more the that, idea? Yeah, exactly. I mean, it could be, could certainly, yeah, there, there could definitely be some customization there, but mm-hmm. the, yeah, the idea being that you would, you know, you wouldn't have to worry about actually hosting your own server, for instance. Right. It's out of the box. It already has a solution in mind or problem it's trying to solve. Yeah. Cool. It's kind of like, basically, if you, I want to kind of imagining if like, if Slack, you know, how they had that huddle feature now, right? Now they have like this like 3D huddle feature or something. And then yeah. you everybody puts on their thing and now they're in the the virtual bowling alley or something. I mean, I don't know, whatever they're. Um. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so after I left, they did kind of spin out some other versions of it. They had a version that was like full 2D, like top down, which was kind of interesting. This was like. I like that, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Go ahead. Um, and then. And then they've kind of now pivoted into kind of spatial audio. So we had a completely custom spatial audio um, backend for for mixing and uh, compressing the audio. 
Is that what, so I'm imagining that 2D top-down view where people walk into the room and then you compute the audio effects or whatever, people behind you and is, is that- Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah, yeah, so spatializing all of that, all of that audio. But the idea was like, not, sorry. Oh, you can go ahead. There, in terms of monetization, that was more of like an IP that they're gonna sell and not, not part of like the overall service. Yeah, or, I don't know for that, for that specific offering, I'm not sure what the plan was. I mean, I had, I had ultimately okay. left at that point, but um, th like they do now, like, like Clubhouse, for instance, uses it for spatial audio. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Is that the one that Randy sent back in the day? The, um, yeah, anyway. Club oh, you, no, this is, so this is just a service for basically having groups of people talk to each other. Gotcha. Large groups of people talk to each other. So having spatial audio for that, for instance. Gotcha. And in, in, in a similar kind of sense to what you would do on an Oculus Rift, where like you get together and play ping pong or something or talk. Uh, in this particular case, there's no, like there's no ability to actually see other people as far as I know. I've never, I, I, I'm okay, talking about it. I've never actually used it. But okay, I think it's, so I think it's VR. It's just more of just nothing to do with VR. No, this okay. is purely just spatial audio. Um, but like, I don't, I don't know if you know what Twitter spaces is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Twitter spaces is just a feature that they have now where you can like host it or they've had for a while where you can host a Twitter space. People can join. Um, you have a group of people that are actually the speakers or the people who can talk and you can have a large, large number of people in a single area, but similar air, mm -hmm. similar idea, but it's, it's spatialized in the uh, clubhouse case. Gotcha. So you walk around the, the location and talk to different people or hear what yeah. other conversations. I, yeah. Um, I mean, <laughs> it's very easy to abuse. Like, yeah. <laughs> Again, unfortunately, I don't know. I've never yeah, actually yeah, used no. it, so I don't know. Sure. Sure. Yeah. What the feature set is there, but that's it's, the, it's really interesting. I like the idea of that virtual office where you can kind of go knock on somebody's door virtually. So to, uh, you know, um, it was, uh, it was cool. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was really neat for, for us. I mean, we, we had already been using the software for this um, and then ultimately kind of refined it for that use case. But mm -hmm. Yeah, it was, I mean, it was just really cool being in this virtual space. Like we were all working remote at the time. So, yeah. Because um, we were just kind of going in head first and trying it out. But it was pretty neat just being in this virtual space where, you know, we could kind of, I don't know, you know, you had your your like office space and then you could like walk e really easily just kind of walk over to somebody else and, mm -hmm. and talk to them versus uh, what we had been living with previously, which was like, you know, going to a meeting room and trying to get everybody to connect and that being a huge pain. So it was, it was definitely a step up from that. And the idea is like, you kind of like live with this thing all, always kind of on. You could, so we had both a desktop interface and a VR interface. So it wasn't okay. like you had to keep a headset on. Um, primarily so like people would- playing, Go ahead. I'll just say people would primarily leave it running in the background, right? And so right, right, if exactly. somebody came up to them and tried to talk to them, they would hear it and they'd flip over to the, you know, to the application and, and start talking to them or gotcha. you know, doing whatever, whatever they wanted to do at that point. But yeah, that's interesting. I can imagine that not even needing the VR is more of like, you're just driving around in a 3d first person shooter kind of environment. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like the, the layout of the office or something or some virtual like dream office or something. Um, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and, and honestly, like, I mean, it seems like a lot of VR companies have kind of gone that way. Uh -huh. Where it's like, okay, well, you know what? Actually, the user base just isn't there. We need to support some sort of yeah. desktop-based interface in order for people to be able to reasonably use it. It's also a lot to put on a headset, in my opinion, and exactly. go I think through that process. Eventually, you get to the point where, like, it's part of your glasses or something, and, and it's just completely unambiguous or completely non whatever invasive, right? Yeah, but absolutely. Right now, it's kind of like a yeah, it kind of hurts your face, and you know, you know, over time and that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Cool. For sure. Hey, awesome, Ryan. Uh, this, I right. been very much enjoyed learning all about your, your background. Um, so, that, uh, so thanks for sharing it. Um, and I'm looking forward to next time we can chat. Uh, maybe we can go into like, you know, how CI works and how, you know, the different software lessons learned you guys, you know, in terms of software development practices and all that kind of just like tons and tons of cool stuff to talk about. So, yeah, uh, absolutely. Thank you. All right. Hey, take fun. care. All right. You yeah, too, bye. Bye.